Hello and welcome to another episode of N64 Magazine Time Capsule. As always, this is the show where we take a chronological look at N64 Magazine to see what's new in the world of N64 from back in the day. If you're new here, don't forget to watch in HD as you can pause and read the articles if you're on a large enough screen or simply head to the link in the description down below to download the PDF versions of this episode's magazine. This month is issue 15, which was the May 1998 release, and look, compared to some of the magazine's stellar covers over the years, this one is a bit bland. However, in the entire history of the magazine, there is no single issue that brings back as much nostalgia as this issue for me personally, so let's jump right in. Magazine editor James Ashton writes this month's intro and explains it's been a busy month travelling over Europe to snag this issue's latest news, including being the first magazine in the world to actually play the hotly anticipated title Mission Impossible, hence the magazine's cover. He explains that readers have complained that since James left the magazine, that the fans felt that the magazine had gone a little soft. But he's here to welcome the newest N64 magazine team member, Martin Kitts. I was always a big fan of Martin's writing style and I'm sure many of you watching or reading will have been too. This month's contents are absolutely packed. It may not have had any of the console's biggest titles, but they wrapped up the latest PAL release reviews, had a look at some interesting import titles, and had some wacky feature articles lined up including how to survive gaming underground. And there was also 12 hilarious GoldenEye quirks. Tucked away in the blink and you'll miss it moment is this issue's feature which is news on Looney Tunes Space Race which I'll come to later. Turning over to the previews and wow the art direction of the magazine here is right on point and I mean come on. Who could look at this four page spread and not think that Forsaken looks like one of the coolest games to look forward to? The magazine had played the game for the first time and they stated it was looking to be one of the best graphically stunning games they'd seen so far on the console. They also gave a nod to Descent on PC which was a game I used to love playing with my dad back in the day and so it was clear these blokes knew their stuff and if they were saying it was like a souped up version of Descent then I knew that would be right up my alley. They went deeper and they did raise some concerns with the game's difficulty and also during this pre-production build of the game they noted that 14 control options seemed too many and they felt that Iguana was struggling to convert the PC game controls onto the N64 controller. Nevertheless they praised the lack of fog and slowdown and said that the lighting effects were something to behold. Another four page spread brings us to the latest news on ISS 98 and whilst looking at my channel stats with half of you being from North America, this will likely not be of interest to any of you. But for everybody else like myself, seeing the sequel to the world's greatest football game in this preview just hyped up the anticipation for another summer of epic matches with your friends. The magazine explains that at first look it may appear to be very similar to ISS, but there's such a huge improvement in the animation and many under the hood improvements and tweaks and changes that it really does feel like a super refined updated version. They also pointed out that this time around Tony Gubber would be commentating and he was always one of my favourite match commentators and so this was something I was looking forward to experiencing personally. GT64 is up next as the follow up to MRC, it's fair to say that there was mixed interest in this one and so the magazine rightly chose just to offer a double page spread this time. The team explained that the studio was basing the game off the popular Japanese GT racing series but surprisingly it was Europe scheduled to get the game first worldwide. They commented on the game's more simulation like feel and pointed out the lack of pop up as being a positive move when compared to MRC. What was an instant concern though was that the publisher were pushing for a release the same month the magazine was releasing and so with so much little behind the game before its release it instantly made me feel like this would be another bargain bin filler or a weekend rental at best. World Cup 98 is up next and let's be honest it was a cash in title on that year's World Cup being held in France. The magazine tries, no doubt under pressure of EA, to distance the game from FIFA 98 but let's be clear, nobody needed this release. The version they played was in a final big testing phase and the team were quick to highlight what they called compression technology which had been added to the game. 
Now essentially this meant that your control button presses actually responded to this time around, so at least EA knew what the biggest issue with the previous FIFA release was. I had zero interest in this one and I do remember my brother picking it up and I was playing through maybe a couple of World Cups back in the day, but the next weekend it was traded in for something else. It's a completely forgettable title. Planet 64 with the latest news is absolutely crazy this month. Whilst the main article explains that finally Nintendo of Europe had launched, it's actually what surrounds it which is far more interesting. At the top the magazine notes that a whole ton of games news landed on the desk too late to make the cut this month. But most interestingly was that Prince of Persia 64 coming from studio Red Orb was in the works. The magazine also touted two persistent rumours. Firstly, that Rare were working on a Gran Turismo realistic style racing game, and also that Gremlin were using their newly acquired N64 dev kits to actually bring Actua Golf to the console. The Game Boy Color was also announced and the magazine advised a full reveal will be coming in a few months time. The latest news from the biannual Tokyo Game Show is up next and this time it's more like the Tokyo Lame Show for N64 fans. Nintendo, who were basically not interested in attending, which made up less than 4% of the show's overall content. It was left then to third party studios to show their N64 wares which were all known to the magazine at the time so there was nothing really new here. Funnily though, the magazine said that Air Border 64 seemed promising and that it didn't play too badly, but it looked really ugly. A couple of accessory reviews are up next with positive rumble pack and memory card releases coming from Blaze. The magazine highlighted that UK gamers had been snapping up Fighters Destiny after their glowing review, making it hit the number one spots on the charts for N64 games. The game in the US, however, had barely snuck into the top 20, and so insert some comedic banter against Americans and you have basically all that there is to read in this article. Planet 64 is up next and there's some trackers in this issue and this is the reason why the magazine sticks in my memory so much. I literally remember pouring hours over these pages, reading the articles many times over in anticipation. First off was Space Circus which most of you know ended up being Starshot. The magazine was impressed with what they played and said that a few more months development they were looking forward to seeing how the finished product ended up. Sadly though, Looney Tunes Space Race got less attention and yet it was one of the games that every issue I'd always look forward to news on. I imagined it as a Mario Kart 64 with more hijinks and basically that's how the magazine explained it was going to be too. They had hoped it could find the balance between Mario Kart 64's multiplayer and DKR's single player campaign. They had screenshots but no gameplay to test yet. New photos and news of F-Zero X and the magazine commented more on the characters and the art style than anything else, but they did confirm that characters from the SNES release were coming over and that alone was enough to make this end up being a day one pickup for me. The latest news on the struggles of Body Harvest were included, but thankfully they now confirmed that Nintendo were happy with the game and it was being set for a release after the incredible challenges of getting approval. They also gave news on the game called Space Jelly, which had been shown in video form, but the magazine had no screenshots to show. They also gave the latest news on Robotech from Crystal Dreams, and you can find out all about that in the episode I did of the N64 beta project many years ago. Space Station Silicon Valley is also mentioned, and DMA put the delay down to wanting to perfect the level design, but they now felt that they had finally cracked it. RPG news is up next and as expected it's all about Zelda again. There's some amazing new screenshots to show off here and Fusoya answers some more common questions from fans of the magazine that they've been asking. Interestingly though there was a rumour that Hybrid Heaven had been changed to now be an N64 DD only release. If you actually look closely at the Zelda screenshots you can see a different version of Hyrule Fields layout which is pretty cool to see. The map style also appears to be dynamic and changes style depending on location, something which wasn't seen in the final build of the game. 2 Rock 2 News is up next and in something which I found quite funny was that the magazine noted that they'd heard the rumour the game would be called Seeds of Evil, something which they hoped wasn't followed through with. They were already lauding the impressive graphics and technology behind the game and picking out some early levels and key features. Banjo-Kazooie also gets an early mention here and some new photos. 
I remember seeing this shot of Mumbo and reading about the animal transformations the game would have and just thinking how cool it all sounded. The magazine also correctly said that they felt that the game was nearly complete and final playtesting was ongoing ready for a surprise launch sometime soon. An Ear to the Ground has some surprisingly correct bits of news, but sadly the Aeon Flux game never did see the light of day. Turning over in the latest charts are there, but as you know I always love the ultra release list to the right. Games such as Unreal, Puma Soccer, Jungle Emperor Leo and Street Fighter 64 always had me flicking to this section as soon as I got the magazine to see if they had new dates for being released. I also remember speaking to my local game store about some of the titles and they would often say that they hadn't seen some of them be listed to shops for ordering and so were unlikely to be any time soon. Max Everingham is up next with the latest news from Japan and he reports that Nintendo was being outsold by 10 to 1 from PlayStation and it was so much of a concern that early N64 game releases were now being slashed in price and some popular titles were being sold for around £15 each now in Japan. An Englishman in Tokyo also comments on the way in which a large eel was hacked to pieces on live TV during a cooking show which was something he wasn't fond of. This month's big feature is up next and it's a deep dive into Mission Impossible. The studio had been invited to France as they'd taken over development to finally get the game ready for store shelves, way later than it being an N64 launch title that had always been planned as. The magazine noted that Viacom and indeed Tom Cruise had placed extremely strict criteria on the game to avoid violence and to make the game more akin to a stealth title. Essentially, they didn't want the game to be an out-and-out -out shooter like Goldeneye. A roundup of some of the game's key levels follows, and the magazine noted that the character animation was much better than, say, Shadows of the Empire, and they were pleased to see a huge range of gadgets which would be needed in order to complete the game's missions. They noted the complexity of the Embassy mission as a highlight, and for me personally, that's one of the best ever levels made on the Nintendo 64. It's just sublime. It's a shame the rest of the game wasn't as intricate and exhilarating as the first time you crack the series of events needed to get the mission complete screen on Embassy. Turning over and Arena is up next with this month's PAL releases for those of us who were here in the UK. We got Yoshi's Story as the headliner with smaller reviews of Wetrix and Quake. Being an independent Nintendo 64 magazine, the team were thankfully rightly away noted how the game had completely divided opinion in the office. Some felt it was sublime and others felt it was just far too easy and eventually underwhelming. Now I personally sit on the fence with Yoshi's story. As a casual playthrough it's far too easy and it is aimed more at children. But the actual game mechanics and scoring system is where advanced players really should spend their time doing the melon challenge. It's just a shame that it's kind of tucked away in the game's manual. The team still did a super job of making the game look appealing and explained the items and concept of the title. In the actual review however, the magazine noted that the game had been slated on its release and noted it as being Nintendo's first in-house failure on N64. That's being far too harsh in my opinion, but the magazine rightly points out that whenever you see a first party Nintendo game being released, the expectation is that it's always going to be a smash hit and Yoshi's story didn't hit that mark. The game is unfavourable compared to Yoshi's Island on SNES and the magazine highlighted that the title's innovations and Yoshi's story's lack of innovation as being a key reason why they felt the game would quickly fall into obscurity. Now 86% is a fairly good score but it's not a Nintendo score that they were hoping for which were usually always over 90%. Wet Tricks is up next and the magazine highlights that it's not a title for everybody and in fact the first time they played they got a game over screen in just a few seconds. They explained the mechanics and that it's definitely a trial and error game which has some addicting qualities but ultimately it will be a Marmite release. The price was cheap for an N64 title so the magazine does praise that as making it worth a punt for anybody fancying something a bit different but in multiplayer, if you don't have an experienced opponent to go up against, you'll completely destroy them, making the mode pretty much irrelevant in the grand scheme of things. Quake 64 gets six pages devoted to it, and for me this was more of a curiosity title as I played the PC original for quite a while now, and so when I found out the N64 release 
was pretty much a straight port, I wasn't really overly interested in getting it. In fact, I only played it because a friend of mine loaned it to me. The magazine mostly aimed the review at those who hadn't played the PC version years prior, and so they gave an overview of what to expect and the terminology of the game. Rightly so, however, the magazine complained about the loading times in the N64 build of the game, and also the multiplayer simply consisting of a two-player mode. They noted the PC game had become so popular because of the multiplayer deathmatches, but having just a head-to-head -head on N64 will really limit the game's appeal. They also noted how the game was already showing its age, especially when compared to Quake 2 on PC, which was already out by this point, and so explained it was probably the last hurrah for the title doing a farewell tour on the console, like N64 and Sega Saturn, but a score of 79% I think is pretty fair, I'd maybe bump it up into the 80% range to be honest. Import Arena brings this month's import reviews from Japan and the US with Gasp being the first title to get covered. Now let's be honest, it's a dreadful game, but at least the magazine did go into some depth with the characters and add in some pretty funny commentary on the character designs. They do ultimately trash the game for what it is, a bad fighting game but they did at least take some time to comment on its positives, such as the character creation mode and the game's lighting effects, which aren't all that bad in all honesty. From my review of the game, many of you did actually have some fond memories of this title, but for me, this was always just gonna be a game to dodge. Turning over, you have leather. I, I, I mean a woman. One day, I'd really like to meet a woman. Oh, and there's a review of Poyo Poyo, which is actually pretty good, although I do have to question what the pink C-type creature has splashed all over its face. In fact, I'd better not think about that. Things don't get any better with Olympic Hockey, which is a terrible hockey game. In fact, it's a terrible game by any comparison. Don't play it, play Wayne Gretzky instead. 60% score is rather generous, I feel. That's all I'm going to say about that. How to survive the gaming underground is what makes this issue so memorable for me personally. Right at the peak of South Park's popularity, the magazine dropped these creations, which I remember avidly drawing in art class one time, copying from this very issue. Remember, this was Martin Kitt's first feature as a staff member on the magazine, and this was going hard on the humour and piss-taking. Look, I can't even explain what <laughs> all of this is to you. You just need to pause each page and read the descriptions and you have a laugh out loud moment for sure. How To has a guide for Mystical Ninja, which as you know is one of my all-time favourite games. They only cover part one of the game, but as my local store hadn't got stock of the game yet, I remember vividly reading over these pages ready for the day that I'd be able to get the phone call saying that the game was now available to be picked up. After the previous issue's review and this How To guide, I remember this being one of the first games I was really super, super hyped for on the console just poring over these pages, looking at the screenshots, and imagining the wild ride the game would be taking me on, it was just such a cherished memory. In fact, I have the soundtrack on as I'm writing this, so sorry, but what, 25 years later, the game isn't still bringing a smile to my face, and that really says it all. And just when that nostalgia trip ends, the how-to guide for Snowboard Kids comes along and makes me change my YouTube premium music list to this game soundtrack, which I absolutely love. This game guide really does give you the lowdown on how to master the game, including unlocking its secrets and which special boards are worth playing. Sadly though, they failed to mention any of these shortcuts and with some levels having multiple ones, but they did mention that they managed to complete every track using special board three, which even now is a huge effort. They were sorely disappointed it didn't unlock any additional secrets by doing so. You can tell the magazine had been dabbling excessively in Goldeneye because they presented 12 cool quirks of the game and explained how you too can set them off in the game. I always find it fascinating to see that even back then players were finding and attempting to create weird and wonderful irregularities in the game, including quite comically here multiple ways to take out Natalia without triggering a game over. Tips Extra is, well, it's quite unremarkable this month, but with some readers, they did write in with some pretty cool GoldenEye strategies to help with certain points in the game. The Doom 64 code, which gives you access to the final level with full stats and guns, including the three pentagram items, which makes the gun more powerful than the BFG, so it's a pretty decent one to write down. It's a really tough level, and on the Xbox version during lockdown, even then it took me a few hours to beat it. 
The magazine's hotline gives the solutions to the first 25 puzzles in Tetrasphere 64 and some commonly known cheat codes for Duke Nukem 64. The Tetrasphere solutions are actually quite useful as the game has over 100 puzzles, meaning it doesn't completely ruin the game for anyone who decided to look at these printed solutions. Skill Club 64 is up next with the latest results and news and next month they note that they will add some additional games for you to help boost your personal rankings on. Likewise, I'm the Best has the latest times and scores for the featured games and it was always cool to see so many people from across the world enter this section of the magazine as the magazine really did have such a large international distribution. The Lilac Wars or Star Fox 64 contest results are up next with the winner snagging a pretty decent score of 2041. So hats off to you Patrick Wessels and I hope you enjoyed your prize. Club 64 is always enjoyable and one of this month's letters to the magazine is simply complaining that there's no chance of getting their letter printed and the prize for doing so is crap. The magazine notes that from this month onwards the Star Letter will get a steering wheel sent to them. Another writer asks about import gaming and the magazine admits that they did some Photoshop work on an image they used which they created a lot of confusion about Yoshi's story being playable with an adapter. There's also an N64 birthday cake to show off but personally I don't think I'd be stuffing a slice in my gob as it looks like it has more E numbers than the 1980s tube of Smarties. A subscription ad is next which is followed by directory which gives you the history of the magazine scores which is always a good reference point. And finally for this issue, the magazine counts down the 30 most important people in Nintendo's universe at the time of the print. You know it's funny that even now decades later, many of these named here are still powerful icons associated with the company. Now sure many of the old guard at Nintendo included here have since died, some of them quite a long time ago, but it's still interesting nevertheless to see names like old Shigsy right up there in the upper echelons of power and control at Nintendo. Seeing the Stamper Brothers are places 9 and 10 however reminds me of just how sad it was that the relationship between them ended just a few short years after this. So there you have it, a quick look at what's in the next issue will hopefully won't take me many months to get round to doing and there's also a mail order advert from Special Reserve. I wonder if they have any more of those brand new Nintendo Pocket Game Boys for £45 available. As always though thanks for watching and until next time.